Welcome to Normalize the Conversation. I'm your host, Francesca Reikiter, and today I'm joined by author, survivor, speaker, podcaster, and a woman whose journey is nothing short of inspiring, Eliza Van Court. Join us as we uncover the transformative journey of claiming space, overcoming imposter syndrome, and embracing authenticity. Whether you're a woman reclaiming your narrative or grappling with imposter syndrome, this episode offers a powerful dose of inspiration, exploring the keys to breaking free from self-doubt on the journey of self-discovery, resilience, and empowerment. Eliza, thank you so much for joining me today. I am very excited for our conversation. Before we begin, I want to check in with you. How are you really? No one's ever asked me that question before at the beginning of a podcast. Um, I'm good. I'm very, very busy, but um, I always say better busy than bored. <laughs> so Very true. Very true. I love that. I like keeping busy, trying. But I have to say this time of year, so we're recording this end of November, and I'm a student as well as a nonprofit founder, and I take care of my grandmother. So this time of year with finals, it's a little too busy for me. I'm not a huge fan. However, staying busy is always good. But thank you so much for taking the time to record with me today. I'm excited for our conversation on women claiming their space. So before we jump into that, I'm really curious what inspired you to start speaking about that. Um, well, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to make it super brief. But when I was younger, I had a really wonderful mother uh, until I was about four and a half, she was healthy. And then she became paranoid schizophrenic when I was uh, about four and a half. And she ended up kidnapping me and taking me across the country by truck from New York to California, from truck stop to truck stop to truck stop. And what happened on that trip made me start to conflate invisibility with safety. I thought if I can just be invisible, I'll be safe. But of course, being invisible isn't safe. It's dangerous. And when you're starting your life as a little girl in a society where you're told to be quiet and be small and not claim space, and you're striving for invisibility because of your trauma, claiming space is really a lifelong struggle. And that was the beginning of a long journey that led to my book. That must have been really hard as a child to go through, first of all, being kidnapped and from truck stop to truck stop from New York to California. That's a very long drive, number one. But number two, to feel like you can't have and take up any space. Like you have to just hide away and hope no one notices you. I imagine growing up like that, it becomes very fearful anytime somebody does notice you or attention is on you. Yeah, I think I just sort of tried to avoid that altogether. <laughs> I had this really long curtain of hair that I would hide behind and I would just sort of sit there quietly. And um, I was really an extrovert. I mean, I think we we're kind of born extroverted or introverted, but I was behaving as uh, someone who's highly introverted because I just was uh, so traumatized and really didn't know how to talk to people. And you've gone from that to now public speaker talking about it all the time and that's amazing. How did you get from, how'd you get to where you are now? Well, I mean, the first thing is I went to school for political science. Then I went to law school for a year. And then I realized after my first year of law school, I got this huge scholarship that allowed me to do anything I wanted. And I thought to myself, you know, I could do any of this and I don't want to do any of it. So I took a leave of absence, never went back and did a two-year acting program and ended up becoming an actor. And then I opened my own, I taught in Boston and then I opened my own studio in Ithaca, New York. And the technique that I teach, which is my own take on something called the Meisner technique, which is this whole idea of learning how to live truthfully from moment to moment under imaginary circumstances. And it really teaches you how to pick up on the minutia of human behavior. So, and understand your own emotional life. So that was step one. And then secondarily, I got hit by a car in 2013 while I was riding my bike and somebody was texting and driving and they hit me. I got thrown on the hood of their car, hit one side of my head, got thrown in the middle of an intersection, hit the other side of my head. And I ended up getting a bilateral brain injury and a subdural hematoma. And my communication was severely 
compromised. So the process of building that up, going from a really good intuitive communicator to a mindful communicator, which is really, really different and breaking down kind of the coding of communication was really revelatory for me. And that's when I started giving talks on communication. And so the final funny piece of this story is that after I would give a talk, I would hear this click, 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 click behind me. And then I'd go to the bathroom and women would follow me into the bathroom <laughs> and they would walk in and they'd, they'd, after they went to the bathroom, they'd sidle up to me and they'd say, I got to ask you a question I didn't want to ask in Q&A. And then they'd ask me the question. And the questions were pretty much the same all over the world, whether it was Hong Kong or Texas or New York. And I realized women were asking these questions in the bathroom because they didn't feel safe asking them anywhere else. And I thought, you know, I really need to take these conversations in the bathroom, in the darkness, out of the darkness and into the sunlight. And that was really my big motivator for writing the book. I almost actually called it Conversations in the Bathroom, but I was told that's not as good of a title. So we didn't do that. I love that you started to bring those conversations to light because I think with women, there's a lot of shame in so many different ways. I mean, overall, the narrative we're kind of taught growing up is like, be a good girl right? Like Mm -hmm. listen, obey, be quiet, do what you're told. Mm -hmm. And it's just hard in general for women to like, feel like they can take up space and they matter. And then you build some self-confidence and you're too bold. You're too assertive. Yeah. Right. We use all that tough language on women and create a lot of shame on if you ask for help, because you should be able to do it all and you get to have it all. What does have it all look like for you? And just all these expectations. So it can be really hard, I think, for women to ask for support, to want to take up space and believe that they deserve to. And I just think it's amazing that you are taking these conversations and hoping so many women have that space that they deserve just by existing, but don't realize that they can take up. Absolutely. I mean, I realized when I was recovering from my accident that there were some women who just walked in the room and they had this thing that just made people listen to them. And I was trying to figure out like, what is that one thing? The one thing that makes them so mag, just incredible to listen to. And just, they had a magnetic personality. And then I realized like in life, there's no such thing as like one silver bullet. It's usually many things. And in this case, I found that there were five aspects that a woman had to be really mindful about. And if she was really mindful about those five things, then she would actually be able to claim space. And the fascinating part was when I broke down those five things, all of those questions I got in the bathroom fit into those five buckets. And so that those are the five parts of my book. And it really, um, it was really an amazing and revelatory thing for me. I love that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what those five things are? Sure. So the first one is claim space with your body and your voice. If you're not able to kind of walk into a room and take up physical space and you feel like you have to make yourself physically small for others, then that's going to be a really hard place to start with claiming space. The second is claim space by building your community. That means getting people into your community who will support you, but also getting people out of your community who would make you small, like anti-mentors. The third thing is we all have these boulders that fall on us in life. And I think a lot of people will say, you know, oh, just get over it, get over it, move on. I don't believe anyone really does that. I actually don't think that's possible. Um, But I do think you can get those boulders and you can whittle them down and whittle them down until they're like a little pebble in your pocket. You can put them in your pocket and you can sort of touch them when things happen and go, oh, I lived through this. I know what to do. Or, oh, I miss this person, but all their lessons are with me. So they don't weigh you down. They're really the lessons that you carry with you and the strength you carry with you, the memories. Um, The fourth thing is people who are actually really good at defending themselves against people who would make them small, aggressors, bullies, et cetera. And the fifth thing is women who are intersectional in their approach to their feminism. So women who really believe 
that they can't just uplift themselves. They can't just uplift other women who look like them. That truly claiming space is uplifting all women and women who are really committed to that. I think because it's just difficult <laughs> to be with women who aren't like you because you make mistakes and you have to be very humble and you have to be ready to learn. And it also it takes a level of bravery to be an advocate. Um, those women were were really empowered. And so those five things, it's not like anyone mastered them, but these women were mindful of them and that made all the difference. Yeah, really for me, that brings up a lot of kind of memories of what I do when I get into a room. I, even if I'm speaking an event, the first thing I do is I grab a seat in the back corner because I don't want to take up any space or I just want to stay out of the way. Um, I pay a lot of attention to people's opinions I shouldn't pay attention to and something happens I'm just like I need to figure out how to get over it but I don't necessarily get through it I just kind of let it sometimes fester a bit and mm -hmm. that's a huge thing for me is I'm afraid to take up space even when I love what I'm doing even when I feel confident in what I'm doing I was taught that I'm supposed to just stay out of the way and I never thought about it in this way so I'm very very mind blown by that because it is important to be mindful of the way we walk into a room and the way we see ourselves in a room because when you mm -hmm. see yourself as someone who's not worthy of being part of a conversation who has to sit and hide in the back you're not viewing yourself with as much worth and value as you have yes and so often people will treat you the way you believe you deserve to be treated Yes, absolutely. And when you learn to treat yourself with that kindness, with that respect, other people see how much you value yourself. But when we don't value ourselves, we kind of allow people to be a little meaner to us. We don't want to defend ourselves. We just want to stay quiet. Again, stay quiet, stay in that corner, just let it go. But there's a way to defend yourself. You don't have to start yelling and fighting at someone, but you can stand up for yourself in a respectful manner because you deserve to feel important. You deserve to be respected. And mm -hmm. it's just so important that we have these conversations because like I said in the beginning, the what you're taught growing up as a female is usually to be a good girl, be quiet, stand to the side. So we often don't find our voices and claim our space. Yeah, and isn't it interesting that when you think about good girl, you think about be quiet, be polite, all of these things. You know, if you think about, I want you to be a good boy, you know, grow up to be a good man, <laughs> you know, what you think of is achieve. You think of be strong, be brave, you know, you don't think of be quiet and be polite and listen to what everyone says. That's not the ideal that we really think of when we think of what it is to be an ideal man in this society. And I really feel like sometimes men need to take a page from the book of what we've been taught, which is sometimes it's okay to make yourself small. Sometimes it's okay to defer to others. Sometimes it's okay to be in the back of the room if everyone's running around trying to get the lighting and everything right and you don't want to get in their way. Sometimes that's okay. But sometimes it's also okay to make sure that you are the loudest person in the room and that you're getting the promotion or that you're advocating for the other person. And I think it's really, I think the, the way that we look at things doesn't really serve either gender to have these rigid ideas of what we all need to do. I agree because it makes it hard for a man to know that they don't have to have an opinion, right? They don't have to be able to know everything and talk about everything. They don't have to be a uh, bold, successful, powerful CEO all the time. They can do so many other things and be so many other things. They can be sensitive and respectful and kind. Um, and women can be powerful, bold, assertive, and also sensitive and kind. We can be mm -hmm. anything. We can take up space when we want to and not take up space when we don't need to. And mm -hmm. all of it's okay. But you're right, those gender roles really kind of push it into two opposite spectrums. And it's not serving anybody because there's times and places where everyone's voice needs to be heard. Absolutely. And everyone should feel that they have the right to be heard always. Sometimes you can choose to sit back and let someone else have the, have the stage. And that's great. 
but you should always feel like you have the right to speak if you want to and need to. And I think so much of the time, you know, people ask me, well, what's the most important thing about your book? Because it has all of these really specific ways where it can help you in every single category. So, you know, from posture to imposter syndrome to shutting down, you know, microaggressions. But what I always say is, you know, if you don't believe that you have the right to claim space, which to me is living the life of your choosing unapologetically and bravely. And bravely to me means not the absence of fear, but fear meeting action. If you don't believe you have the right to do that, then nothing I say in my book matters because you won't try it because <laughs> you don't feel like you have that right. And every human being has the right to claim space. And some of us are given the message we have that right a lot more than others. Absolutely. You do have the right to take up space, to be bold, to be, to live your life however you choose. And one thing that you said was imposter syndrome, which is commonly a reason why we don't go after what we deserve and believe that we can take up space. So first, can you tell us what imposter syndrome is? Oh, imposter syndrome is really this idea that you're an imposter, <laughs> that you're not really supposed to be there. Everybody else is supposed to be there, but you, you somehow snuck into the big kid's table <laughs> and you really should be at the little kid table and everyone's going to discover that you should be at that table. And then they're all going to catch you. And then your true ineptitude will be, you know, exposed. And I think very few people don't sometimes feel imposter syndrome, but some feel it much more strongly than others. I was actually having a conversation about this with my dad earlier today because he was like, I don't understand like imposter syndrome. And I was like, because you have so much confidence in yourself. I was like, maybe a little too much. I love it for you. I wish I had some of your confidence. But I was like, for me, what life is like a lot of the time is do I deserve to be in this room? Where when I go to events, I go straight to that back corner. I can be the keynote speaker and I'm still confused on whether or not I should be in this room and if I deserve to be here and afraid to talk to people because one of the first questions I'll usually get is how old are you and so yeah it's, it's so fun I love that question because automatically I'm like am I too young to be here um well, does what I have to say matter right now am I do I have enough life experience so for me, that's just such an important topic is this imposter syndrome because it's hard to claim space and to believe that you deserve to be heard when you're so afraid that you just are in the wrong space. You know, it's so interesting about what you just said, and I think it really lends itself to this belief I've had about imposter syndrome for a long time, which is that the first thing you have to examine when you're feeling imposter syndrome is, is this something that's innate coming from you? Or is the space you're in making you feel like an imposter? Because your father, who is, I'm assuming, a white man, you know, every space is really not going to go up to him and be like, are you sure you're supposed to be here, sir? Are you sure you're supposed to be here? Right? So if no one's ever made you wonder, am I supposed to be here? then you'd be much less likely to feel like an imposter than if whenever you walk in a room, people say, well, how old are you? Mm -hmm. So the question really is, is it you that needs to change? Or does society need to be a little more careful about how we're interacting with people and making sure that all spaces are welcoming for all people? And I think the first step to imposter syndrome when you're experiencing it is to sit back and say, is something in this situation making me feel like an imposter? And if there is, then how can I make sure that I don't have to worry about quieting my own voice? I'm not the problem. <laughs> how do I make sure that when someone says stuff like that to me, I don't let that become internalized so that I develop imposter syndrome? And I think that's a really important distinction we don't talk about enough. Absolutely. I've never thought about it that way. And it does matter when you walk into a room what people say to you or how people treat you like you said my dad he walks into a room no one's questioning whether or not he deserves to be in a room it doesn't matter what room he walks into 95 percent of rooms I walk into right now in my career it's immediately why is this child walking in I have cut my hair and dyed it and aged myself a bit and finally starting to age a little in my face thankfully but it's still usually one of the youngest people in the room and that is one of the first questions I get so automatically I'm like do I deserve to be here 
when you walk into rooms already expecting that question and then hearing that question, it is really hard to feel like you deserve to be there and take up space. But if we look at it as that's not my fault and I didn't do anything wrong for being in my 20s, I can't control when I was born and how old I am, then and change it to society needs to change. That we need to have these conversations. People need to be more kind and respectful of everyone so everyone feels welcome. It helps remove some of that like imposter that something is wrong with me that I'm causing it and I need to fix it because those ruminating thoughts are also going to lead to that I need to just hide away and hope no right. one noticed me. And I think also for you, if I may, <laughs> um, I think that when someone says that to you in your head, the answer should be, wow, I am really young. And that's why they're asking me this question. And I'm still here. I've been asked to be here despite how young I am. Think of what I've accomplished to be asked to be in this room. I am uniquely qualified to be here. No one else, everyone's shocked because they weren't here at this stage in their career. And I am. So I am like an extra badass. <laughs> so, so in many ways, that question is not a reflection of, oh, you're too young. I think the question is in some ways, wow, amazing that you're here when you haven't had your career in gear for that long. And I think if it were me, I would try to flip that question on its head and take it as an extreme compliment. I'm going to work on that thought. Reframing is everything. I've been working on that a lot lately, thought reframing. But it's so true. And the way that I interpret the question also impacts how I feel. And that's my own insecurities coming into play. So when we are not working on our insecurities, we're allowing them to build up. We have imposter syndrome. We have these ruminating thoughts. It is really hard to get to a space where we're like, okay, I deserve to be here and have a voice. So for someone who's maybe experiencing that combo, what's some advice you have for kind of maybe taking the first step to overcoming it? Well, <clears throat> my, advo my advice is not going to be the typical advice. <laughs> so my thought on this is that if you wait for the moment where you feel you deserve to be there, especially in a society that makes so many of us not feel like we deserve to be there, we'll never make a move. It's sort of like having kids. Like if you wait for the right moment to have kids, you'll never have kids because there's never a good time to have kids. It's always going to like having kids young has huge benefits and huge drawbacks. Having kids older has huge benefits and huge drawbacks. And so instead of thinking like, I need to feel ready for this, which actually I just think <laughs> like nobody really ever feels ready. Instead think, I'm afraid. This is scary. But feeling afraid and being scared will not kill me. I just need to do the thing anyway. Because the more you do the thing, is more you are brave, which again, in my mind is fear meeting action, the more you will actually get positive feedback eventually. And then you'll start to feel like, oh, yeah, okay, maybe I am. And then you take another step ahead of where you feel like you should be. And then at first you get pushed back and eventually people go, oh, wow. Okay. And so what you really need to do is decide what you want to do. Listen to your fear. But if your fear is only coming from fear and not grounded in something really important that you should listen to, ignore it. So let's say, you know, one of your fears is I, I want to take out a $300,000 loan for a new business. I have no way to pay it off. Then you think about that and go, maybe not yet. <laughs> maybe I don't want to, you know, declare bankruptcy. And that's a good fear to listen to. Or if you're at a gas station or, you know, in a bar and someone comes up to you and you're scared, that's your fear's way of saying like, this is dangerous, be careful. But if your fear is just my fear is I might not do it well. Well, yeah, you might not do everything well in your life. You, you might fail, you might succeed, but taking a risk isn't about being sure that it's going to work. But taking a risk is about doing something you care about and understanding you might fail and failure is part of learning and growing. And it's one of the best things you can do to continue to learn and grow and move your life forward. So do it anyway. That's my thing. Who cares how you feel? Just do it. I love that because you're right. The timing is never going to be right where you're suddenly the most confident person in the world ready to do it because 
it's scary the first time you do anything, no matter what it is, it's scary the first time you do a speaking engagement, the first time you, first day on a job, first time you do anything is scary because you don't know what to expect and it's new territory. And if you live your whole life waiting till you're suddenly confident to do it, you may never make that first step. So it's so important to, like you said, listen to that fear. Is my safety in concern? Is this a situation where it may not be great, like putting myself in risk for bankruptcy? Or is this something that's just, I'm worried about failing, I'm worried about making mistakes, I'm worried I might not be good enough, but I believe in myself and I'm gonna try anyways. Or even this is really important to me, so I'm gonna try anyway. I mean, if somebody's been you know, pummeling you emotionally your whole life, it can feel very hard to believe in yourself because you've been told there's nothing to believe in. So I think in many ways, it's more, not do I believe in myself, but is this important for me? Is this really something that I need to do to feel like I've fulfilled myself in my life? And if the answer is yes, then all of those things that are weighing you down, telling you I can't, you just can kind of look at them and go, oh, okay, you're there. That's okay. We're still doing this. <laughs> Yeah, it's so, it's so amazing to me how these are conversations we have to have because we're not talking about it, but it's so ingrained in us, again, to think that we don't deserve to make that risk, to take that risk, to take that chance. And I know when I look at like me and my younger brother, there are so many times where for him, he's just like, I don't know, I wanted to try it, so I did. And for me, I'm like, I'm calculating everything that could go wrong, why it could go wrong, why it's my fault, what's going to happen. And if we both took a little bit of each other's mindsets and he was like, is this the right decision? How badly do I want to try this? Um, is this a safe option? And I took a little bit of, I want to do it, let's do it. It would be so different for both of us. And that's the thing, we can't be completely ignorant of the fear that we may have when it could be a dangerous situation, but we can't not give ourselves a chance. We don't give ourselves a chance. We don't take that first step. We don't go out of our comfort zone. We don't get to live up to the potential that we have. And that's really unfortunate for us because we deserve to take up space to explore who we are and to be the best part of ourselves. I totally agree. I mean, someone asked me why I wrote my book once and I wrote this essay about why I wrote it. But one of the things I wrote, which really is, again, against conventional wisdom, is that I was sick of people telling women to journal. <laughs> I was just so sick of it. I'd actually done an interview with a very prominent magazine. And the woman who was the reporter said to me, it was so great interviewing you because if one more effing expert, she didn't say effing, tells me to tell women to effing journal, I'm going to shoot myself. <laughs> Because, and if you think about it this way, you know, if a man is struggling at work, he's like, wow, I'm having a hard time at work. I don't know if I can do this project. How many times do you think someone's going to be like, well, Bob, I think you should journal. Just go home and journal. They're not going to, they're going to be like, well, how can you do the project? Let's talk it through. Let's figure out how to make this work. Right. And they've actually done research that for it was actually on women in STEM specifically, but I suspect this happens to women across the board, is that when a woman calls her parents and she says, you know, I don't know if I can do this. I'm really struggling in school. The parents' reaction is, well, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe you should quit. When a, when a man, a young man calls his parents and says the same thing, their response is, I know you got this. Just figure out a way to do it. What resources do we need to get together to get you to do this? So I think women are taught that when we have a feeling, the feeling needs to dominate all. And, and I, I obviously there's a flip side of that, which is men are taught they're only allowed to have one feeling and that's anger. They can't like, you know, that's why people make fun of men who are like, I love you, man. Like, why is that a joke to tell someone you love them? That's beautiful, right? Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's obviously we want more of each, <laughs> but I think women really need to start thinking, you know, I'm stronger than I think I am. I'm more capable than I think I am. And even when I'm afraid, I don't need to give up. I don't need to go home and think about it for 10 hours. I can just do this thing. Because so many times, you know, my clients, they'll say they can't do something 
and I'll say, yeah, you can. And then they'll go do it. And they're like, oh, I could. <laughs> so I think sometimes we just need to tell ourselves we can if we don't have anyone there to tell that to who actually can tell that to us. It's so baffling to me the messages that we get at a young age. And they genuinely impact us growing up when you're suddenly taught, I'm stressed about something. Okay, then give up. Don't try it. Let it go. It's not for you. Or I'm stressed about something. You're going to overcome this. You're going to succeed. You've got this. It really does play into your mindset. It really impacts how you feel as a human being and your level of worth for yourself. And then going into that, like you said, being the good girl and being quiet versus being a good man and being successful. It's so hard for us to just get to a place where we recognize these messages suck. What society's been telling us sucks. It's not right. It's not fair. We don't have to listen to it. So when we finally get to that point, it's really scary because then you have to take that first step and say, what I've been taught, what I've believed about the world and about myself does not have to be true. That's one reality. I could be a quiet, I could be super quiet and stand in a corner and never claim any space and just ex exist. Or I could coexist in a world with people and step into my power and into my light when I want to. I can be quiet when I want to and have a voice when I want to. When you get to that point where you know you can make that step, I think that's one of the scariest moments. What advice do you have for someone when they're like, I think I want to take a step, but I can I take a step? I mean, I think that the first thing is when you take a step, the question is, if it's a really hard thing with huge consequences, if you fail, the question I always ask people is, can you not do it? So, you know, I taught acting for 20 years and I would have people say, well, you know, do you think I should be an actor? And my answer was always, can you imagine doing anything else? Cause acting's really hard. And if they said no, then I, I would say, well, there's your answer. <laughs> you have to do it. Right. But if you don't have to do it, go be an accountant. There's nothing wrong with being an accountant. If that would make you happy, that's what you need to do. You know, or if you would be just as happy being an accountant, why would you ever choose to be an actor? It's crazy. Right. But if you need to be an actor, then that's what you need to do. And I think for every choice in life, the question is the cost benefit analysis is, you know, is the cost, you know, going to be worse than the benefit? Right. And if you're just afraid, like, oh, the cost is I might fail. That's that's not a, that's not really a cost unless it's going to destroy your whole life or something. But if the cost is I'll fail, who cares? <laughs> just do it, you know, and I, and I think that is really you want to surround yourself. I think one of the big things is surround yourself with people who believe that you're as capable as you are not with people who treat you like a delicate flower that might, you know, flutter away if the wind gets too strong. You know, my friends who I have around me are incredible, accomplished, amazing women. If I called one of them and was like, I can't do it anymore. They'd be like, no, you can. <laughs> You're awesome. Go do it. <laughs> so, you know, surround yourself with women who see you for the amazing woman that you are and offer that same support to other human beings who we surround ourselves with matters so much because the voices around us, in fact, the voices in our heads, when we have people around us telling us like, you've got this, you can do it versus, are you sure you want to do that? Do you really think that you can handle that? Is that really the right? I don't, I don't think I can see you in that position. I think your dreams are like too far fetched, right? People who are maybe invalidating you, knocking you down, not giving you space to grow. That. You're going to hear those thoughts like a broken record in your head when you're hearing them around you all the time. And these are the people that you value as your friends and that you love and respect because you hope they see you the same way. And when you respect and value someone's opinion and their opinion is very mean to you, no wonder you're feeling insecure and you don't deserve that. So it is so true that we need to surround ourselves with people who encourage us, who call us out in a positive way and tell us, no, you can do this go and do it. Yeah. And I think one thing is, you know, to make sure you get anti-mentors out of your life or at least learn how to neutralize them. I was talking to, I did this actually a TikTok a while ago because I often hear young people 
say, oh, but my parents told me this and, you know, my coach told me this or whatever, you know, and I always say, listen, if you're like 25 and under in my mind, I mean, I'm much older, <laughs> but you know, you're a literal blastocyst. You, you don't know anything. You have no idea what you want to do and you shouldn't, you have no idea where you're going to go. You have very little wisdom. I'm sorry. You just don't. <laughs> so how is it that anyone else knows anything about you and what you can or can't do if you're nowhere near understanding that yourself and you're still discovering they can't so why let them write your story yes i that 25 year old i love that because it's so true you're just trying to figure out who you are and when people are trying to write that narrative for you before you even pick up the pencil it's really difficult. You are absolutely incredible. As we are wrapping up, how can people connect with you, purchase your book, hire you to speak? Um, well, they can connect with me on all the social. <laughs> um, they can also, except for I'm very ra rarely on X, um, they can also uh, connect with me through my website, which is elizavancourt.com. There's no you in court. Um, they can get my book anywhere books are sold. Um, but, uh, and if you're on TikTok, you can get it through TikTok shop, but you know, there's that. Um, but you can really get my book anywhere books are sold. Um, and in terms of speaking, you can get a hold of me through my website. And it's one of my favorite things to do in the world is go give talks and workshops and help people use communication to claim their space. So feel free to reach out about that for sure. And any media inquiries can also go through my website. So, and I think what you're doing is amazing too. So I'm really excited to have been here and been able to have this wonderful conversation with you. Thank you so much for listening to Normalize the Conversation. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. This podcast is an initiative of inspiring my generation. Focusing on normalizing the conversation, bringing education and awareness to the forefront, and amplifying global voices to spark change and hope. Inspiring My Generation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization on a mission towards suicide prevention through awareness, conversation, education, and support. Connect with us on Instagram at Inspiring My Generation and visit our website, inspiringmygeneration.org, to learn more about our work and how you can make a difference.